When I was about 15 or so, I became obsessed with the idea of joining law enforcement. It wasn't an obsession that lasted for very long, but I felt at the time like if I was a detective or a police officer, I would feel clever. I'd get the chance to feel like my deductive reasoning skills were really special. I loved mystery stories and characters that could follow evidence wherever it led, who could determine the most unlikely circumstances from seemingly scant data. And at that time, I knew of only one show that was approaching crime solving from a new, fresh angle that so perfectly laid out a consistent and defensible method for finding criminals with little to no concrete data. Not due to the superhuman capabilities of its crime stoppers, but due to its extensive understanding of theory. And that show was Sherlock. I'm just kidding, it was Criminal Minds. The show follows the behavioral analysis unit of the FBI as they fly all over the country, helping local police departments solve cases, usually serial murders. The twist is that these agents don't just find subjects by studying how a crime happened, they study why the crime happened in the way that it did. In other words, they study how the nature of the crime informs the psychological profile of the unidentified suspect, the unsub. So, for example, while Sherlock Holmes can determine the height of a suspect by studying how they would write on a wall, the behavioral analysis unit asks why the suspect had the need to write a note on the wall in the first place. By doing this, they're able to predict the kind of life the person has led. This includes prior criminal behavior, traumatic incidents in their lives, and even what they're going to do next. And then, with the help of the bodacious and occasionally problematic Penelope Garcia, they look for suspects that match the profile. And then the episode ends, usually with alcohol as a means of self-medication, which the characters seem to believe is normal and healthy. The show dominated my high school experience. In fact, it was a bit of a phenomenon in my high school generally. I don't really know why. Maybe it's because there was a lot of closeted queer kids in my high school and Matthew Gray Googler appealed to all of them. The show started pretty dark, almost cold in tone. These characters prioritize their job above all else. For understandable reasons, their job is kind of big and overwhelming and important. And the motifs of loneliness and despair often eclipse the more lighthearted and comedic moments of seasons one and two. But things change really fast. And suddenly the show became this bizarre conjugation of some of the worst low stakes comedic and romantic subplots you've ever seen in your life and some of the most depraved acts of sadism ever put on network television. But what sticks out to me after all these years is the fundamentally hard nature of a lot of the beliefs that this show is steeped in. In the many, 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 many years since I was considered a youth, leftist media criticism and just a general mistrust of law enforcement has become a lot more commonplace. Most of us on this corner of the internet know what propaganda is and this show doesn't necessarily age well to people in the know about the motifs of propaganda. The show debuted in 2005 and concluded in 2020, which, fun fact, is way longer than you thought it ran. The show is known for being a bit of a professional revolving door. The showrunner, Jeff Davis, left after season one. The most famous actor on the show ran away, almost literally ran away in season two. And the network tried to purge the cast of all the 30 plus women in season six. Yes, really? Yeah, you know what audiences hate looking at? AJ Cook, utterly unlookatable with her 30 plus attributes. I mean, cannibalism is A-OK, -okay. I'm sure that's someone's kink, but AJ Cook? AJ Cook? Get her off screen, have some decency. In the last season, the cast is almost completely unrecognizable. And the differences the show went through in as much time is night and day. If not for the fact that the episodic formula remains so stagnant, you might not even know that the first and last season belong to the same show. To me, the first two seasons are lightning in a bottle, and the last two seasons make me want to be struck by lightning and to get on the bottle. I don't know why a show can't just quit while it's ahead. I won't lie, a lot of the show was a slog to get through, but Paradoxically, a lot of the bad parts of the show drew me in a bit more. The show gets weird, and the reasons for its weirdness really got me thinking. And by thinking, I do mean ranting about it endlessly to my friends so that I now don't have friends anymore. Despite the show's aesthetic grit, it's deeply naive to its core. 
And this can be very charming, even heartwarming, but where the show tries to apply its understanding of the world to real-world issues, we have to confront the fact that its naivete is still a form of ignorance. Criminal Minds wants so badly to say something big, which is why it very often wanders into topical minutia. We waited 27 minutes and no one came. No one. Do you know what that's like? Huh? To be powerless? What happened to your brother was a tragedy. Mistakes were made. Yes. But it can't say anything that meaningful because it doesn't really know what it's trying to say in the first place. It wasn't a mistake. And it wasn't an accident. The system worked exactly like it was built to. The premise of the show is that very violent criminals can be understood and overcome by studying their behavior. And this means that a lot of really, really awful people, by pretty much any metric, need to be psychologically dissected and often empathized with. And that last part gets us into trouble. Because who really wants to empathize with a rapist or a torturer or a child kidnapper? Or, you know, an anarchist? Indeed, there are very few people that the BAU, and the show by extension, believes deserving of empathy. And I think a lot of this issue is tied to the radical changes that the cast and crew see, particularly when Mandy Patinkin chooses to leave in season 2. Mandy Patinkin plays BAU veteran Jason Gideon, and he is arguably the point of view character for seasons 1 and 2. And for good reason, among these many very talented actors, Mandy Patinkin is the clear powerhouse. Not only was Jason Gideon a very compelling character, but Mandy Patinkin brought something very special to that role. Watching those early seasons, you get the sense that he has this almost instinctual understanding of the criminal mind. This particular unsub, he displays both a heightened, he, it's actually almost a poetic sense of right and wrong. This understanding seems to go beyond words or theory. He's far too fluent in this language to be held back by anything as academic as that. Gideon embodies the agony of empathy, being able to sit across the table from a pretty horrible human being and ask them about their mother or negotiate with them as if he cared about how they felt. He often performs empathy for violent criminals at the exclusion of treating his own colleagues with the least bit of courtesy. If, if you were in your office, you'd have more room to spread out and you get a fresh perspective. Do you think? Maybe? No? I need to focus on the manner in which Annie Stewart was killed. Anything that might have been done to her post-mortem. Uh -huh. Get this stuff out of here. Get this out of here. Uh, Where's the uh, blueprints of the house? Oh, they're right here on the screen. That's I don't want the blueprints on the screen. I want oh, something I can hold on. Stop in here. Can you fix it? How are you breathing here? You trying to make a little cooler in here? Uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. And early on, we set this tone that this is the cross to bear for all BAU agents. Understanding the sickness inherent to committing serial acts of extreme brutality alters the way one gets to live in the world. Understanding the criminal mind is both the goal and the price. But the problem with that is it's kind of hard. For a person suffering with delusions or who has rightfully earned hatred, empathy is a piece of cake. Wally Brisbane. <sighs> yeah, I know the Brisbans. You took this little boy. No. No, I did not. No. No, stop it! You will, you will be punished. God is punishing you. No, 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 no. I brought you an angel. See? When will you leave me alone? But how do you empathize with a person who knows that they're hurting, who likes hurting, who will continue to hurt regardless of the consequences? And as with many shows with difficult premises, the writers just seem to stop caring at some point. Around the time Rossi joins the team, the language used in reference to unsubs becomes more contemptuous. They use terms like sick and perverse and degenerate. While Jason Gideon is burdened with his understanding of the sadistic mind, the BAU without him is merely disgusted by it. The show begins a slow and agonizing descent into almost complete black and white thinking, both in terms of the hard and fast profiles of their unsubs, and in their own worth. This takes the show to some areas of cringe that 
I take personally. As I said, this show is a clear piece of propaganda, and the misconceptions that they have about law enforcement take their writing to some pretty unique levels of stupidity. Here are some things that criminal minds mistakenly believe about law enforcement. Decriminalizing sex work would make sex workers more vulnerable to abuse. It very concretely would make them safer. It's a conspiracy that the FBI and CIA have been systematically fucking with the black population for decades. It's not a conspiracy. Anarchists are violent? We're mainly just fucking around in group chats. Leonard Peltier killed FBI agents. He didn't. That the FBI are often treated as scapegoats or otherwise vilified in oversight committee hearings or in the courts. Give me a break. Bisexuals don't exist. I forget what we were talking about. Not to mention the entire premise of the show that you can capture a criminal by psychologically profiling them is kind of bunk. The real life BAU has a far lower success rate than the one depicted in the show. And I think we all kind of know why. The internal logic that the show subscribes to is that psychopaths, by far the most represented kind of criminal in the show, are predestined to commit evil acts, that they are essentially evil. The show doesn't make much room for the real-life fluidity of people and the possibility that we can overcome or simply evade triggering environmental or biological determinants of antisocial behavior. Normally, I don't really care about realism in my shows. All of my obsessions generally walk a tightrope between showing what is relevant from the real world and balancing that with what actually matters, which is like emotional truth. Sometimes emotional truth is fantastical, and that's fine. But the issue with criminal minds doing that is that behavioral analysis is basically a forensic form of psychoanalysis. The show is about interpreting human beings, and it does so incorrectly. Like, often. And not only is the show about the complexities of the human mind, that's kind of what most art is about. We watch or listen or read stories because we want to see reflections of ourselves taking place on screen. We find that stuff thrilling. We're really self-centered. What can I say? I told you that I gave up on art and that I, I disown all of you artists out there. I did so for a reason. But the people of Criminal Minds don't always behave like people, least of all the criminals. A criminal on Criminal Minds is almost always essentially evil. And evil does as evil is. It's as simple as that. But that isn't to say that the show always falls into this trap. Indeed, it shines when it confronts and dissects this premise. The season 2 episode Sex, Birth, Death is about a teenager who approached the BAU suspecting that he might be what the show calls a sexual psychopath, which is a term that doesn't seem to be a real thing. The right term is a sadist. But anyway, he proactively approaches the BAU trying to find out if he is a danger to other people. Surely that demonstrates a measure of agency and self-determination, that people are complex and often in conflict with their own desires, but even our boy Jason Gideon can't subvert the writer's expectations. Not a question of whether he ends up killing someone. It's when. The show takes this problem and makes it exponentially more difficult by introducing the threat into the lives of the characters that we know and care about the most the members of the BAU. As the show goes on, the characters start being individually targeted by criminals in more and more elaborate ways. <laughs> Let's put it that way. The BAU becomes a targeted group simply for having chosen a career where they have lethal authority over mentally ill people all while getting to harass people that they don't like. That's so unfair. The increasingly ridiculous attempts against the lives of the members of the BAU leads to them becoming more tribalistic and insular. It's the BAU against the world. And this leads to the show's other fatal flaw. It desperately wants its characters to experience dynamic arcs, but it can't because it refuses to recognize when its characters are flawed. In fact, it refuses to deal with any problem that it introduces into the characters' lives. The characters in this show go through it. Big things happen to them. They suffer, they go through events that really ought to change them, but they don't change as a result. It's sort of a conventional wisdom in writing that you want to torture your characters, but 
the torture itself is not the end goal there. The, the goal is to create the change that leads to emotional catharsis. <laughs> like, you don't just want to torture them. That's a little sadistic. I want to show you how this series attempts to change its characters, but simply cannot. The team very quickly becomes very boring, which is really sad because the team dynamics in the first two seasons are some of what makes it so memorable. Characters not getting along, characters feeling adversity or unreciprocated feelings, awe, dread. So JJ really likes Reed in the very beginning, but no one really gets Reed, least of all Morgan, who sort of seems to dislike everyone else in the group anyway, or at least he's clinging to some masculine sense of excellence that he holds in high regard. Uh, but Gideon does like Reed, and he seems to be sort of a mentor figure to him, which is good for Reed because he didn't grow up with a paternalistic presence. And Gideon also didn't really get a chance to raise his own child, so he's like embracing this do-over period with Reed. Each set of characters has like a very distinct dynamic. L is systematically broken off from the rest of, gr of the group and flung into the outer darkness because these broken people, representing a fairly broken law enforcement system, are unable to support her. These psychologists are unable to connect to her anger and fear and pain and frustration to make a comfortable environment for her to heal from her trauma in. How tragic is that? <laughs> That's really sad. They can only use their behavioral analysis to understand psychopaths, but not their own friends who are going through trauma. That's interesting. But by the middle of the show's run, the group becomes this homogenous force of unthinking tribalistic loyalty. And the show seems to think that we're gonna get all warm and fuzzy inside because of this, but I don't agree. I think it's a lot more satisfying when these very disparate people manage to work together to do incredible things. There's a solid block of episodes, probably around season seven or nine or whatever, they're all the same, where the last scene is the entire group clinking glasses of wine and laughing for like a minute. I actually developed my own drinking game while rewatching the series and it goes like this. Take a shot every time one character goes up to another character and asks a variant of the question, Are you okay? No, no one is okay. That's what a story is. Characters go through trials and change as a result. Please ask a more incisive question just one time. It's just the most bland and general way to begin a heart-to-heart -heart conversation imaginable, and the writers keep doing it. Also drink every time a character says, You know you can always talk to me, right? Or, you know this isn't your fault, right? No, I didn't know that. Thank you so much for telling me. Now sit down. So let's talk about these characters and their failed arcs. I'm obviously not going to talk about every single main character. I only have something to say about, like, five of them, and I'm so sorry about it. Alex Blake? Sorry, you're far from big love to me. Jennifer Love Hewitt? I don't even remember your character's name. Stephen Walker, I'm glad you walkered into that car and died because I did not like you. Apparently this guy was in the last Airbender movie, so that explains why he can't act. I'm very sorry. I think that movie just like sapped the talent out of all the people that were in it. I picked out first and foremost the performances that stuck out the most to me, and of more importance, the arcs that these characters went through. Or, more accurately, endlessly resisted going through. As I said, Jason Gideon starts off as the de facto heart of the BAU. The toll that the job has taken on him is something that the show takes great pains to establish up front. Without Gideon, the hook of the show doesn't sink in as deep. The first episode demonstrates that Gideon is returning to duty after a deeply traumatic experience wherein several of his teammates lost their lives. But it's more than trauma in this case. Gideon made the call that led to the deaths of his subordinates. And he made that call based on a misapplied understanding of profiling. At least, I think that's why. The show is very reticent to admit that profiling isn't really all that accurate, so I think we're meant to interpret this as Gideon's fault. The actions of the members of the BAU are life-and-death decisions, as active and potentially deadly as those of the people they track. Culpability is sewn right into the thematic fabric of the show. 
For a time, Gideon seems to adjust back to the life of a BAU agent. He is able to savor the happy moments of saving a person's life, or enjoy the company of the group he had previously kept at an arm's length. He gives himself more leash, as it were, allowing himself to take on responsibility without the expectation that he will have to suffer for it. For a while, it even seems like will be able to enjoy his life outside of his job, a life where he's allowed to pursue the happiness outside the gritty joys that his job allows him. And then he's punished for it. Jason Gideon is not ordinary. He wields the power of the state at all times. He can take away someone's life or freedom at his own discretion. How can a person like this ever have a life outside such an occupation? Frank Breitkopf is one such person who is in danger of Gideon's power. And he reacts to the threat by pulling at the leash that Gideon has allowed himself. In the end of season two, Breitkopf kills the person that Gideon is in love with. He then kills himself and an innocent woman. The BAU, indeed any member of any official law enforcement agency, has the power of life and death. They can make children into orphans and parents childless at a snap judgment call. What I love about Gideon is his take on the genius, bunny-eared lawyer archetype. Gideon, for all the strange charisma he brings to his social interactions, isn't very curious about people. Why would he be? He understands them. They're old hat to him. Gideon may be a genius detective, but he's not this Sherlock character that craves the puzzle of a mystery to solve. In the end, it's Gideon's sense of duty that keeps him coming back over and over again. In fact, the people he loves most are the ones that he is best able to predict. People who behave in ways that are easy to interpret. Sarah Jacobs, who was Gideon's love interest, was an unimpeachably good person. Sarah was a doctor. She was a mother of three boys. Hello, Jason. She worked and ran a treatment center for patients with terminal cancer. She dedicated her life to easing the pain of others. The BAU member he cares about the most is Reed, who he can outthink and outmaneuver better than anyone else. I was winning. Actually, he would have had you on three. A kid who is such an open book, he doesn't even know how to conceal his gun properly. Piece of advice, pipe cleaner. Where you wear that gun, begging someone to take it off you. He doesn't patronize them, I don't think, but he's sort of charmed by them somehow. Gideon, as a gifted detective, subverts his genre stereotypes. And Agent Gideon, in many ways, is damned by his profound knowledge of others. Which is why he shares so little of himself, yet he pours his heart into every case we handle. He has the emotional means by which to care about the mistakes he makes. When Sherlock or Dr. House take a wrong turn and end a life, they move on pretty easily. Gideon never moves on. He never forgets. He writes their names and puts their pictures in a little book. It's people he treasures. It's not victory. It's not the puzzle. His ability to empathize with a criminal mind is demonstrated to be a skill distinct from any other. It's heavy. It's deadly. I've harped on this a lot, but I don't think I can emphasize enough how baked into the heart of this show Gideon is. The show really struggles without him, and when he... spoilers is killed off in season 10 by an unsub he's been chasing for decades, you can't help but feel like your heart is being stomped on. <laughs> Gideon left the BAU for himself, much like Mandy Patinkin, who was so psychologically affected by the show that he literally just stopped going to work one day. You see a lot of Mandy in his work with Gideon. It's hard not to. He's a brilliant, soft-spoken guy with a fixation for his work. It's apparently very difficult to team up with him because he's very passionate about what he's doing, but there's a real sense that beyond that, he's a really good person who cares about people, and his empathy sometimes gets in the way of him saying or doing the right thing. Guys of, of strangers and, uh, uh... So what are you guys saying? That, that you felt that it was baffling in the end? Or oh, that you I felt... thought that it's, it's a very weird show. It's a it's very weird odd. show. It's, it's an odd show. There's no, there's never been a show like it. Well, then what in do terms you? Of, but, but some people think it's just extraordinary. No, but, no, but what, no, but, oh, what do you no, say not, to those folks? No, I'm not talking about good What's or bad. I can't speak for Mandy Patinkin, but Jason Gideon leaves the show a broken man, but one we also feel a profound sense of hopefulness toward. He's walking away from duty to pursue happiness. He doesn't know where he's going. There's no plane to catch, no killer to pursue, just a blank canvas. 
and the remaining years of his life to capitalize on. This makes the manner of his death all the more upsetting, and perhaps not in the ways that the writers would have intended. We learn in the season 10 episode Nelson Sparrow that in the many, many real-life years that Gideon and Patankin have been gone, he dropped everything in his life to go chase an old serial killer. He's not even with his team anymore. He's all alone without any friends or family. He is engaged in an activity that he does not like, for reasons that we don't really understand, in a way that sort of takes a dump on what was presumed to be a pretty decent ending for the guy. We're not just sad that a beloved character has died before his time, we're heartbroken that a character that we saw take his happy ending by the reins just lost complete control over his destiny for reasons that are unfathomable to us. It's not that Gideon earned that wistful walk into the sunset. A tragic ending can certainly be appropriate for a noble character. It's that this isn't the ending to the story of the arc that was being told with Gideon. The thrill of the chase, the obsessive dedication to the hunt, the Sherlockian game, these were never things that Gideon cared about. And the fact that he didn't care about them is sort of what made me care about him. It would be funny if it wasn't so needlessly cruel. You gave him a good ending. Why undo your work? And the worst part is, when he leaves, he makes way for... Oh, Rossi. I came to a conclusion uh, while watching Joe Montana's performance as David Rossi. Completely independent of any research into his life or what he's done with it, he's not a good actor, but he's a lovely man. I just feel like he's a nice dude. And maybe I'm wrong and he's cancelled in real life, but like, so be it. I think he's cool and his coolness really gets into his character portrayal. Rossi starts the show with this sort of hard-boiled persona. He's like the cockier version of Gideon. But Montaigne just has this sincerity about him that can't help but transform him into this sort of sweet Italian grandfather figure. Just look at that scene where he tries to reconnect with his daughter. Had you known, would you have stayed? I can't speak for the David Rossi of 30 years ago. I'm pretty sure Mandy Patinkin would have read that scene with a measure of restraint. You can actually see a similar scene with Gideon reconnecting with his son after what is implied to be many years. He's just not about to give this big emotional outpouring like Montaigne does because he's a better actor. I don't care that his relationship with Aaron Strauss is a hilarious bit of backfill or that his relationship with his second wife seemed to disintegrate between seasons. Or even that he seems to know every single famous person that exists, despite the fact that he's famous for catching serial killers and writing books about it. I love this guy. And while I definitely wish we had Gideon over Rossi, I can't be mad at Rossi. I don't really think that he has much of a character arc, but I will just note that his presence signifies that tonal shift that we were talking about earlier. Rossi's ability to empathize with a criminal stops where the writers does. As the writers get meaner and more cynical, a more no-nonsense Rossi takes the place of the more subdued and inquisitive Gideon. Rossi is the herald of the end of the show's greatest strengths. Though he is not the herald of the end of the show. Not by a long shot. Thomas Gibson has this ever-present knit brow, jaw set expression that tells you he is a very serious adult human male and he used to be a prosecutor but he stopped being that because he wanted to shoot people more. He has this unflinching frown that lends itself to really good dry humor and some of his best moments are when he just shuts down Reed's quirky boy energy. Samuel. Yes? Tell the men from the FBI who the Gahe are. The Gahe are mighty spirits who dwell in desert caves. Reed. Is your name Samuel? But this presentation also makes them really satisfying to mess with. Viewers are just entranced by macho men being vulnerable. 
it's a byproduct of the gender binary. It's captivating to watch this illusion of masculine coolness just break before our eyes. When Hotch suffers, Gibson is forced to break through this hard-ass facade and show a little humanity. You convinced me. No, no, you hung up on him. You practically killed him yourself. Don't worry about us. We'll get this guy without you. This forces him to walk a tightrope between retaining the control that exemplifies his character and exposing that he is, yes, a human being. And that, first of all, is just really good for the show. Some of the best emotional moments are when Hotch is suffering. But secondly, it also reminds us that this job is fundamentally different from any other. These guys are deeply affected by their work because you can't just stop being a human being to get the job done. Is there a socialist message to Criminal Minds? No, that's dumb. Hodge makes a statement very early on in the series. Uh, it goes something like this. I'm able to be a good family man and also good at my job because I can decompartmentalize. When I'm at work, I only focus on my case. And when I'm at home, I only focus on my family. But this statement is just begging to be challenged. Because Hotch does not decompartmentalize nearly as much as he wants to, when he starts having trouble with his wife Haley, he takes that shit straight to work with him. So you plan to be locked inside with me, with no guns or weapons? I won't need a gun. You saved my life by coming here. But unfortunately for you, I'm not a five foot tall, hundred pound girl. All your life, you've gone after victims who couldn't fight back. At your core, you're a coward. A lot of criminal minds deal with the messed up consequences of living in a patriarchal society that has very rigid gender norms. Men expect things in this society, and they also have certain expectations for themselves, and this leads to a lot of messed up garbage. Honestly, this is most of what the show is about. Built into just about every profile is the assumption that the killer is a man, and a lot of the team's work is done by extrapolating out the many ways in which masculinity affected the killer's mind. It's a bit like brain worms. If the killer is a woman, it almost always merits an explanation, and the reasons for the killing are almost always connected with femininity and gendered expectations, like child rearing and trauma at the hands of men. Hotch encompasses a lot of these archetypical ideas about masculinity that we all have. He's this mask of cool detachment. He's this paternal figure within the BAU. His anger is often bombastic and all the more scary because we don't know where it comes from. He's a mirror image to many of his unsubs. In his own words, some people who were abused growing up turn out to be serial killers and some grow up to catch them. He's consciously drawing a parallel between his own behavior and the psychology of the people that he hunts. Whether or not you literally believe that Hosh was abused is personal. This was debated ad nauseum when I was in high school. <laughs> I think you could read this as an abuse of the general toxicity of masculinity in our culture. A lot of boys slash young amabs are treated to this kind of conditioning. It's the, uh, you and I are just the same trope. But it's kind of true. By his own admission, yeah, they are kind of similar. And it takes a good moral foundation and active effort to keep him doing the right things and standing up for the right people. There's one fun episode in season four where the group is hunting down a female serial killer with daddy issues who is posing as a call girl to target her victims. She develops something like a fixation for Hotch. It's not an obsession, it's more like she's putting him on a pedestal because she sees him as a daddy figure. She's this crusader type. Her cause is to expose the corruption of wealthy men who can skirt around the consequences of engaging in illegal activity while neglecting their families. Men who use their immense power and privilege to avert the law that everybody else is subscribed to. The law that Hotch enforces unequally, as she argues. And during this argument, she calls him, excuse my language here, a whore. A lot of the language used in the earlier seasons of Criminal Minds probably wouldn't hold up today, but they are still using the word prostitute in the reboot, so I don't really know what you want to make of that. This doesn't shake his resolve, though, and he continues doing his job. But it stuck out to me because it's such a specifically gendered 
insult, and it's almost ridiculous to imagine Hotch not being affected by it somehow. He's the macho macho man, and he's just like, cool, you're calling me this feminine slur. Like, not even for a second. He's not even momentarily thrown by this very specific insult. The killer is pretty blatantly trying to emasculate him by calling him docile and submissive when interacting with higher powers. For all that tough, renegade, individualistic energy that FBI agents, mostly Hodge, are subjected to, fundamentally they are passive tools in a political machine that primarily works to protect the elite. It's a pretty incisive criticism, in my opinion. It reveals both gender and justice as hollow facades that don't really hold up under scrutiny. And Hotch, in my recollection, never really concludes this arc, which is sad because it's kind of a compelling one. The struggles of Hotch are the struggles of the entire team. How do you act like a superhero when you're actually just a human being? And this is for reasons that I've already touched upon. The writers began raising the stakes by having individual members of the BAU become the targets of criminals. This removes a lot of their agency. They no longer have choices about when and how they engage in a case they are more than often reduced to a hysterical mess because, yeah, when your loved one is in danger, you're not going to be able to keep your cool and make rational, interesting decisions. It also moves their actions away from the theoretical field that most interesting detective stories take place in. All of their actions become distinctly practical in a way that kind of stops them from doing anything weird and cool and interesting. There are more complicated moral decisions to be made when there is sort of a cool disconnect between the detective and the subjects. Like, should we wait until the killer strikes again so that we can develop a pattern and maybe catch them the next time? You're not going to do that if they have your loved one host being held hostage because, like, the next person they're going to kill is going to be the one you love. Hotch suffers from some of the worst woobification in the entire show. He's this family man who loses his entire family due to his commitment to his job. He's brutally tortured by a serial killer who then goes on to kill his wife. He barely saves the life of his very young son and then has to hold his hand while he grieves over the loss of his mother. So yeah, bad things just kind of happen to him <laughs> all the time. The episode where his wife is killed is kind of interesting because, again, He's at his most vulnerable, and he's out of control when he finally gets his hand on George Foyette. Gibson does a fantastic job. He's very interesting to watch. He's a very good actor. But it didn't really bring out any sort of internal reflection. Like, the writers didn't seem to be affected by the gravity of the scene. There were no big decisions to be made as a result. He shares the responsibility of parenting his son with Haley's sister, and there seem to be no long-term ramifications of doing any of this. A thing happens to him, he deals with it, he moves on. A decade passes. And it's just kind of like weird, because in the story's quest to become more sensational, it actually becomes more passive and boring. Hodge is at his best when his emotions are in conflict with his learned behavior, when his, like, cold machismo gets in the way of being an emotional being who wants to protect people. That's what he's doing as an FBI agent. He's crying when he should be angry. He's sensitive when he should be rigid. He's fighting when he should be leading. That's fun to watch. Washing away that inner conflict removes the most interesting parts of his personality. And that goes back to the fact that the writers really have trouble challenging their characters. They experience hardships like... <laughs> They sure experience hardships in their lives, but they rarely get the chance to make decisions based on those hardships. They never change their behaviors as a result of those hardships. I don't think that's necessarily a problem. Like, I think if you have a very specific vision in mind that's sort of about disempowerment of your protagonists, that could be really good, but it doesn't work here. Hodge's arc is a very conventional story with all the conventions missing. It's hard not to love Garcia. A radically individualistic genius, 
she's the member of the group with the least in common with the rest of the team. Though she does, of course, get the requisite tragic backstory. But she is, both literally and figuratively, removed from a lot of the horrors of the job. And this is appropriate, because she's also the least personally affected by the job. Her dress is often whimsical and impractical. She gives a lot of monologues about seeing the good in people. She's the comedic opposite of Hotch. Garcia is too good for this cruel world, and that means we have to literally detach her from the field work that the other BAU agents do. When she is on the field, she tries to bring that levity and purity to these dangerous situations. Why didn't you go and find someone before you ran out there? Because when I got shot, I remember thinking the last thing I'm ever going to see in this life is the man who killed me and I couldn't let that happen to him. He had to see something good before he died. Garcia doesn't have much of a character arc. She remains pretty static throughout the show's run. She doesn't care about the rules, but not really in a hard-boiled sort of way. More of in a I didn't bother to read the manual sort of way. You're a loose cannon, meow meow, fuzzy face. I'm just a reckless renegade. Sergeant Stone's a loose cannon. Ah, you shut your trap, fuzzy face. Instead, she puts her love of people first. Garcia doesn't fall into any of the tech nerd archetypes that I have personally seen. Garcia is socially aware, she is overtly sexual, she's very conscious of her presentation and her fashion choices. In fact, her tech skills really have a lot more to do with her protective instincts than any kind of cold drive toward puzzle solving. She's a healer. She uses her abilities to keep her friends safe from a distance. She sits on the sidelines to remain the symbol of purity that exemplifies the noble heart of the members of the BAU. She hates blood and can't handle seeing people in pain. And the BAU, by extension, are absolved of any sort of corruption. Because how could Garcia love them if they were tacitly involved in things that were bad? Because we all know that Garcia is good. Duh. She wears pink. The BAU aren't agents of an intentionally overbloated and deeply political apparatus of state control with a largely unchecked power of life and death. They're heroes. They're protectors. They're knights in shining armor literally in one episode, and this purity of intention is largely endowed upon them by Garcia. I honestly don't have a lot to say about Garcia, and honestly, I think that's a feature of her character rather than a bug. She is unfortunately objectified in a lot of the instances where she's given any kind of narrative attention. She is the dog in either Pet the Dog or Kick the Dog. When she's shot in season three, this is mainly treated as an unspeakably horrific act that puts pressure on the agents at the BAU to catch the guy who did it. By the end of that story, I really don't feel like I understand Garcia better. I feel like I've just seen a likable character get brutalized to spur the actual main characters into action. You know, the guys with the guns. Underdevelopment of female characters is nothing new on Criminal Minds, but it's particularly repugnant because the show is sort of about the objectification of women and it never seems to be able to treat women as anything other than objects. It's unfortunate because there's some really good actresses on this show. Paget Brewster is very talented. She holds up really like it's just huge swaths of the show with her ability to remain controlled and funny and dangerous. AJ Cook is fantastic. She just brings this wonderful constrained emotion to every scene that she's in. Like. You can always tell that she's holding something back. Whenever she has someone to work with, and even oftentimes when she doesn't have anything to work with, she'll just randomly infuse a scene with, like, complexity. And she has no right to do that. But I don't think the show is really written with women in mind. It's a show primarily written for men to imagine what it would be like to save women. We're going to talk about one more character, and you probably know who it is, and you may or may not be upset with what I say about this character. But just bear in mind that I speak out of love and, um, profit motive. <laughs> Okay.
his name is Reed because he because he reads really fast. <laughs> so my thing about Reed is he seems like a bit of an idiot. Naturally, I was a gender non-conforming kid when I was watching Reed and I gravitated toward him. But that doesn't mean that he was characterized well and he wasn't. <laughs> Criminal Minds does something with Reed that I compare to BBC Sherlock, which is like they treat intelligence as this sort of mass that you can have more or less of. You know, you 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 take a lot of of intelligence and you you put it into a little a little a ball and um you get someone with a super high IQ who can read really fast and who remembers everything that they they, they read which means he said something on that call that tells Hotch where to go read what did he say exactly she's lost some weight must be because of all the stress you caused her where's the little man oh there he is now you think like captain america because of you that's your wife in the line hold please hi open the gate and i'll drive in or here I thought you had a photographic memory eidetic memory and that's primarily related to things i read like i said this is something i think i've heard but i do not agree that that is what intellect is i get so much more of that heart pounding adrenaline rush inducing mind boggling quick thinking sharpness from someone like Gideon, who knows how to pull someone's strings to get them to do his bidding, or someone like Hodge, who can weave together disparate artifacts to gain a picture of a person and use it to gain control over a situation, or someone like Prentice, who can use charisma and a breadth of cultural awareness to communicate effectively, or not communicate at all, then with someone like Reed, who repeats things very well. There's something in the Criminal Minds fandom known as the Reed Effect. This is when a person goes off on a random tangent about information that they have lodged in their brain but is not relevant to anything that was already being discussed. And to me, that doesn't signify intelligence. Let me just say that having knowledge is wonderful and fun. But knowledge does not equal intellect. Reed regularly fails to demonstrate a true understanding of the facts that he has memorized. He often spouts out whole paragraphs of information that seem like he just read on Wikipedia. A well-trained parrot can also repeat Wikipedia articles, but we don't give them PhDs. Further, Reed has a lot of difficulty explaining the things he says to laymen, which to me indicates that he doesn't have a fully integrated grasp of a lot of the stuff that's in his head. And while I assume the intention of this choice was that we would love watching this adorable boy chick talk to us about stuff that he knows in a really excited tone, I almost always read this behavior both on and off screen as more a product of self-obsession than as a genuine love of knowledge. It's like you were just standing around waiting for your turn to talk rather than actually listening to the information that was pertinent to the conversation that you were having. How is this person who seems to have no understanding of how human beings work supposed to understand them enough to actually catch them? And this comes through when bad things happen to Reed. The Criminal Minds writers have a very consistent problem with characterization, and that's that characters seem to respond to trauma and stress to emotions that are very common in this line of work in the exact same ways. This isn't always the case. Jason Gideon begins the show while suffering through the effects of a fairly recent trauma. Many months before the first episode, Gideon made a call that led to the deaths of six FBI agents who are implied to be the core of the previous BAU unit. He's cold and often treats his teammates with contempt. The first character to go through a trauma during the continuity of the show is Elle Greenaway. Greenaway is transferred to the BAU from a unit that works with sex crimes, and her flaws are made very clear from the beginning. She has come face to face with some of the most repulsive expressions of toxic masculinity that exist, and she developed a short fuse as a result of being there for so long. There's something wrong. We gotta pull him over, I can feel it. I don't know the word repeated more than any other in your file. Patient. If you want to slap him, you give me a reason. She acts without thinking, which is something that Gideon is able to identify easily. 
Probably because this is something in her that he sees in himself. Break down the door. No, we don't have probable cause. No judge is going to sign a warrant based on that information. You're the life of a child against the price of a door? As a viewer, you see how her background as a sex crimes investigator is brought back into her life thematically as an unsub, breaks into her home, shoots her, and then puts his hand into her wound to write on the wall in her blood. She doesn't feel safe anymore. She was always passionate and deeply protective, but now she's downright paranoid. When she finally breaks and kills an unsub, someone who was violating women in a similar way to how Elle herself was violated, it feels like a natural conclusion to her story. But it's also an irredeemable act. There is no team support. She did a bad thing for understandable reasons, something that can be said of many of the criminals that she tracks. Greenaway's exit from the show provides a fully rounded, satisfying, and tragic story, and her shitty behavior toward her other team members feels realistic, justified, and in character. I find myself feeling for her even as I balk at her actions. On the other hand, Reed comes off as a whiny little bitch. I'm sorry. I know he's had a hard life, but my god, this girl can whine. Boys have a way of sorting these things out for themselves. Yeah, they sure do. Right now, Owen's out there sorting out with an assault rifle. Reed. What is the matter with you? What do, what do you mean, what's the matter with me? I've never seen you act like this. Oh, really? Oh, in the, in the months that you know me, you've never seen me act this way? Hey, no offense, Emily, but you don't really know what you're talking about, do you? I came to your house for ten weeks in a row crying over losing a friend, and not once did you have the decency to tell me the truth. I couldn't. You couldn't? Or you wouldn't? No, I couldn't. What if I started taking Delilah again? Would you have let me? You didn't. Never thought about it. Maybe just because like when I watched the series again for the first time in a very long time, I was finally older than Reed was when he started the show. And he just seemed like this annoying little whippersnapper to me. And I'm just like, I'm fully 28 and I don't have time for this drama. Basically, in the earlier seasons, I found myself getting a lot more annoyed with this character. As lovable as Matthew Gray Goobler is, and as heartbreakingly woobified as Spencer Reed is, I developed this knee-jerk disgust response anytime he expressed himself, especially during his addiction arc. The thing is, Reed's simulacrum of Greenaway's breakdown arc is too similar to that character to feel authentically like Reed. These characters come from radically different worlds and have specialties and different lives and personalities and triggers. Drama is created to facilitate emotional reactions, okay? I get that. And there's a lot of great catharsis that comes from expressing oneself in a very heightened way. But specificity is the name of the game. And sometimes Criminal Minds does specificity with Reed very well. In the episode Elephant's Memory, Reed and Morgan are able to forego all of the preamble and get to the heart of what's bothering Reed. Reed. You know, you're not the only one who identifies with him. You said I was a high school jock. I was. But not at first. My freshman year, I was five foot three. I weighed a buck twenty soaking wet, so trust me when I tell you, I got my ass kicked every day. I was in the library, and uh, Harper Hillman comes up to me, and she tells me that uh, Alexa Lisbon wants to meet me behind the field house. So what happened? Alexa wasn't there? Well, she was there. So was the entire football team. They stripped me naked and tied me to a goal post. So many kids were there, you know, just watching. Nobody tried to stop them. I begged, I begged them to, but they just, they just watched. It's like midnight when I finally got home and my mom didn't, mom was having one of her episodes so she didn't even realize I was late. <laughs> you never told her what happened? Never told anybody, I thought. It's one of those things that I thought if I didn't talk about it, I'd just forget. But I remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, Reed, you don't need an eidetic memory for that. You know, we forget half of what they teach us in school, but when it comes to the torment and the people who inflicted it, we've all got an elephant's memory. 
it's great. It's almost a completely straight conveyance of facts with a few emotional comments thrown in. But the truly expressive aspects of the scene are all in Matthew Gray Googler and Shamar Moore's acting. Googler plays the scene as though he were embarrassed to even be telling the story. The story existing is what's embarrassing, even though it wasn't his fault. It's immediately understandable and you empathize with it. Being a lonely kid without many friends suddenly thinking that someone out there likes you, and then being punished for thinking that such a thing was possible. There's no need to shout to get the point across. We get it. It's deeply sad. I indeed, this subdued performance makes a lot more sense for him. Reed is regularly punished in his social sphere for being obnoxious and loud. As a kid, he kept quiet about the abuse that was happening in his school to keep his mother happy. When he spoke up to convince his father to stay, he was shut down immediately. I don't think I'm alone in thinking that Reed's reactions to emotional triggers would lead to him being more subdued, more withdrawn, protecting himself from what people might think if he opened up. This is to be contrasted from the rest of Reed's behavior in this episode. However, by the end of the series, he won my heart. By the time Hodge leaves, Reed has experienced a total and believable character transformation that had me hooked. Reed begins reconnecting with his mother around season four, after years of pushing her out of his life. He wasn't able to deal with witnessing her mental illness. This led to a many years long progression of trying to reintegrate himself into her life and save her the limited amount of time that they have together. He takes her on trips, they seem to talk to each other a lot, he spends up almost his entire free time on her. At the same time, Reed also begins thinking about his social life, particularly his romantic life. As Greenaway notes in an earlier episode, Reed doesn't really put himself into situations where he meets new people very often. Under Morgan's tutelage, he gains a little bit more confidence in himself, and this culminates in the season 6 arc where he meets a woman named Maeve. During this storyline, Reed falls in love with a person he's never met before. From my understanding, this added some fuel to the fandom fire that Reed was actually asexual or maybe demisexual, which isn't strictly relevant to what we're talking about, but I do think it's funny that there was a time when the Criminal Minds fandom thought that the writers would actually make a canon queer character. Not today, you gullible homos. Losing Maeve triggers a personality shift in Reed. He's noticeably more concerned with his friends and his mother, and this propels him into the final beat of his character arc. In season 12, after desperately attempting to reverse his mother's dementia, Reed goes too far and begins smuggling illegal drugs in from Mexico, hoping to help her. Along the way, he is targeted by Cat Adams, who has a crush on him? I don't really know. It's it's not a very well written story and I didn't like it very much. But anyway, he gets drugged. He's then framed for murder and he's thrown into a federal penitentiary for several months. And that plot point on itself was insane. Like I, I genuinely kind of gagged a little bit when he actually got sentenced. He didn't get sentenced, he got charged and he he wasn't like given bail or anything. I don't really know how that works. But it actually shocked me. Prison as you can imagine, changes how he relates to his emotions. While his everyday state is more subdued, his anger becomes explosive and physical and violent. When Reed gets out of prison, he's a completely changed person. And I don't just mean that he's more traumatized because as we've established, the Criminal Minds writers don't know how to write an ongoing trauma recovery arc. The writers just kind of like refuse to deal with trauma past a certain point of time and then you kind of just have to forget that it ever happened. But Reed's overall affectation does change, and maybe this is due to the work of Matthew Gray Googler above the work of the writers. You can tell, and it has more to do with Reed's PTSD, that his time in prison affects the way he deals with other people. He's measured with his words, he listens carefully to other people, and he doesn't talk endlessly. He maintains at all times this sort of placid smile, and he listens very passively in conversations. Before the end of the show, Reed has one last face-off with Cat Adams, and it all begins when he is tasked with making a friend at a local park. What the fuck? When he's told by his therapist to start a conversation with 
a random stranger in the park, we would think that his now 15 years worth of character development would have given him a level of conversational aptitude, especially because we've now seen him excel in these situations several times. But no, of course not. We get this flanderized version of his 23-year-old self who still won't ask someone on a date. Anyway, Reed's new love interest is then held hostage by Cat Adams, and the stress of this nearly breaks him. While I can't say that I approve of the weird fetishization that the show uses to portray Cat Adams sexually harassing Reed almost constantly, it's compelling to see Reed struggle against the violence that he's learned. Like I said, the show is at its best when it's kind of pushing toxic masculinity to its furthest possible constraints. And by the end of this arc, Reed actually begins a relationship with the person that he saved. The violence that he learned as a result of his trials has seemingly melted away, and he's now just a fully realized human being. He's a wonderful character to watch grow up. But the show finds a way to fuck him up. <laughs> Best you believe. Guess who shows up to the final party alone? Spencer Reed. Why? Why? God, why? Why doesn't the love interest that he worked so hard to obtain, the person that has signified the greatest change in the entire run of the show, the best arc of the entire series, why is it not re represented in the final fucking finale? Why wasn't his love interest arc the thing that signified the biggest change, the best arc in the entire series, not represented in the final episode? I think it's because this show can't really write characters that change. I think it sees humans as fundamentally stagnant and static beings. Gosh, there is so much I didn't talk about with this long ass show. I didn't even bother with a section about Prentice or Morgan or JJ. Even though I like those characters, I just couldn't bring myself to write it. I guess I kind of felt like I was starting to repeat myself, if you get me. Bad shows don't just mess up in random ways, they have these fatal flaws that they keep slipping into. And the ways that this show messes up get kind of repetitive after a while. They don't seem comfortable giving characters fatal flaws. They don't seem comfortable giving characters fatal flaws, and they don't seem to embrace the moral ambiguity of the subject matter, even though it's sort of inherent to the idea of law enforcement. They seem incapable of characterizing in distinct and specific ways. They don't seem to understand the personalities of the characters that they wrote. I've run out of script. Oh dear. And this show is so baffling to me because I remember just being absolutely mesmerized by it as a teenager. I don't have anything profound with which to, to end this, this video, but um, if you liked it, give me a comment explaining to me why Criminal Minds is actually the genius work of leftist propaganda. Personally, I'm ready to be convinced. Uh, are are you uh, attracted to, to Reed? Just tell me. If not, who are you attracted to in the main cast? Um, if it's Hodge, don't tell me. Stephen Walker? I'm glad you walkered into that car and died because I did not like you. Stephen Walker, I'm glad you walked into that car and died because I didn't like you. I'm glad you walked into that. I'm glad you walked into that car. I'm glad you walked into that car and died because I didn't like you. That line has been in my head for months, and I don't think I've said it out loud yet. But it made me giggle.